Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Dr. Lloyd D. Kenlo II, Pastor Lloyd D. Kenlo II, Lloyd D. Kenlo II, or simply David Kenlo. Um, God has blessed us once again to come before you um, and share with you the Word of God. And so it is a privilege and it is a blessing to be able to do this unhindered and freely um, in this great country that we live. And so for the past several months, I have been discussing or lecturing concerning the theology that came out of what many call the Protestant Reformation, and I'm just simply calling it the Reformation. And so, and so once again, we give our attention to these things. Uh, the Reformation is an, a, 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 it is a pivotal point in the history of the church. Most Christians kind of sort of believe that whatever organization they are in, what denomination or maybe independent church, that that's when the church began. It's just not true. And so there's 2,000 years of church history and within that history, uh, there are pivotal historical events that explain, you know, why we are where we are at today and why we believe what we believe. And so these things are important. And so the Reformation is a pivotal event in the history of the church between the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter 2 and the year 1517 um, October 31st when Martin Luther posted his 95 theses entitled The Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences commonly known on the castle door in Wittenberg Saxony, Germany, and uh, you can't see it right now, but I have those 95 theses um, on one of the walls in this particular, in my study, and so this is when it began, and so there were other men who played a vital role in this uh, reformation, uh, these men didn't agree on every point of doctrine concerning things not essential to salvation but they did share a common core of biblical doctrine that they and hopefully we can clearly see articulated in the holy scriptures and uh, these biblical doctrines um they were what was needed to dispel uh, many of the some gross errors and some heresies that had gradually developed in the Roman Catholic Church um, in what we would call Western Christianity. And so they weren't originally seeking to start a new church, but Reformed Church, by going back to the scripture alone, to find its roots and teach those roots again and maintain those roots forever. And so this core body of doctrine, it later, it later became expressed in what we call the five Solas 
and also the doctrines of grace. The five solas were and are sola scriptura, which means scripture alone, solus Christus, the Latin for Christ alone, sola fide, the Latin for faith alone, sola gratia, gratia, for grace alone, solo, sola deo gloria, of course the Latin for to the glory of God alone. And I think for my next lecture series, next lecture series, I'll talk about those solas. But there are also the doctrines of grace, and uh, it's five of them. And uh, they are the doctrine of the total depravity of man. This is the biblical teaching that man is so infected with a sin nature that he inherited from the first man, Adam, that every aspect of his person, body, soul, and spirit, is corrupted or infected with the sin nature. This does not mean all humans are as evil as they possibly can be, but it does mean we are as bad off as we can be because the sin nature that we have, it makes it possible that any of us can commit the most grave and evil of all sins. Um, this sin nature that we have, or that man has, I mean, it separates man from God. It inclines men away from God to Satan, the God of this world. As I've already said, it makes it possible to commit any evil. It makes them or renders them unable to do anything in helping themselves, having a right or a saving relationship with God. In the classic text that speaks to this, Romans 3, 9 through 12, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And so, the totally depraved nature or sin nature of man, it is what makes it impossible Far from the grace of God, for any person uh, to come to God through repentance or a change of mind and faith in Jesus Christ according to their free will, for man's will is really not free, it's, it's in bondage to a sin nature. And so, you know, left to himself, man will freely reject God every time unless the grace of God intervenes and so the state of man's total depravity it is what makes the remaining four of those um, doctrines of grace necessary if any is to be saved and spend eternity in the presence of God as opposed to the torment of a place Jesus likened unto many things, outer darkness, a place of weeping, wailing, and as the King James says, the gnashing of teeth. And then number two, there is the unconditional uh, election of God. The unconditional election of God is absolutely necessary if any person is to be saved. Why? Because man is totally depraved. In other words, because sins, uh, man's sin nature prevents him from turning to God on his own, if any are to be saved, God has to act. They must be chosen by God to this end, according to his sovereign will, plan, and purpose. Because remember, man left to himself, he will never choose God. 
It's like Adam in, in, in the Garden of Eden. When he sinned, he didn't turn to God. He ran and hid and tried to cover himself up. And God had to come to him. And even still, Adam didn't turn to God. He began to make excuses as to why he ate from the tree. God had forbid him to eat. And so unconditional election is God choosing to save some in order that he be glorified in his magnificent grace, love, and mercy, but leaving others to their own personal rebellion and rejection of God unto eternal damnation. And through this, God will be glorified for his justice and his wrath against sin and evil. And so the classic text that reveals the unconditional election of God is Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. And here's why he did it. According to the kind intention of his will. For what purpose? To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And so these verses are crystal clear, for they distinctly say that those who are saved were chosen by God to be in Christ before the foundation of the world. God predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ and to himself. All of this occurred before uh, God made the universe, and God did all of this according to the kind intention of his will rather than some foreseen faith in the redeemed. And then there's the doctrine of the limited atonement. You know, the limited atonement, in my opinion, is better uh, called a particular atonement or a specific atonement or a definite atonement. And so the atonement, it is what took place when Jesus died on the cross to pay off the sin debt in full. Therefore, the atonement Jesus accomplished on the cross, it specifically atoned for the sins of God's elect or those chosen by God to be saved before the foundation of the world according to the kind intention of his will or look at it like this all whom God chose to be in Christ before the foundation of the world as I just read out of that Ephesians 1 3 through 6 text um, they are the specific ones Jesus made a real atonement on the cross and through this he eternally secured their salvation one of the best passages that reveals this is John 10, 14 through 15. Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And he says, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus specifically came to lay his life down to atone for, he says they were his sheep. And these sheep were those God chose before the foundation of the world according to the kind intention of his will. And so everyone who is saved or redeemed through faith in Jesus Christ, his burial, and his bodily resurrection from the dead are those whom God definitely and definitively secured their salvation through Christ's atoning blood on the cross of Calvary. And 
you know, whether you know that or not, if you know Jesus, it's true of you. Jesus' death on the cross, it was specific to accomplish a particular thing in the sovereign will, plan, and purpose of God. And that was to redeem those um, who he chose to be in Christ for the foundation of the world. And that is one of the most difficult doctrines of the doctrines of grace for many of my brothers and sisters in Christ to receive. And, you know, I really don't understand why you would want to be in charge of your salvation for even a minute because if you were in charge of it you'd be lost I'd be lost and we would all be lost um, but praise God he has sovereignly chose some according to the kind intention of his will to redeem to save and it is those Jesus came to lay his life down for on the cross and they were his sheep. You know, Jesus told his disciples, you know, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Um, and so this is what the limited atonement or specific or particular atonement is all about. And so now we turn our attention to the fourth of these doctrines, the doctrine of the irresistible grace of God. And the text I want to read in relationship to this is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 9 through 10. And it reads like this from the New American Standard Bible. For I am the least of all the apostles, who am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. That is the word of God. And so the doctrine of the irresistible grace of God, it is another um, of those doctrines of grace that is often misunderstood by many genuine Christians because of what they think it means. And the reason why many think incorrectly of this doctrine, this biblical truth, is because I don't think they've really done any in-depth study on what uh, classical reform theology teaches concerning the irresistible grace of God. Most have not given significant attention to what the biblical documents teach concerning this necessary truth. But they have only read or heard what someone else has said about it and most often this is incorrect information that is filled with what we call straw man arguments. A straw man argument is a philosophical term that describes someone who deliberately misstates someone's argument, words, or thesis in order to make their argument appear to be the stronger argument or the correct one. And so, one of these straw arguments is the belief that when we, as Reformed Christians, and all that means is, beloved, we have an attachment to the church that, I'll put it this way for clarification's sake, the Christianity that separated itself from the era and heresy that was in the Roman Catholic Church. We have a connection and a link to that. If you're not Protestant, I'm, I'm sorry, if you're not Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, I'm sorry, beloved. 
that's where your roots are. And so, um, one of the strong arguments is to believe that we as Reformed Christians, or simply those who believe in the doctrines of grace, when we say we believe in the irresistible grace of God, they think we are saying God is forcing people against their will to be saved. Or they believe we are teaching God's irresistible grace cannot be resisted because God forces it upon people contrary to their will. And thus they kind of sort of believe, you know, they come to faith in Christ kicking and screaming, saying, I don't want to be saved, but God, you are forcing me, so I guess I will be saved. That's what people think. This is not the theology of the Reformation concerning the irresistible grace of God. In view of this, when we talk about irresistible grace, we are not talking about God forcing someone to be saved. But we are talking about grace that is effective, effectual. Some theologians call it special grace. Irresistible, effective, effective, and special grace is the biblical truth that God's grace always accomplishes God's plan, God's purpose, and God's will. Irresistible or effectual or effective or special grace is the biblical truth that God's grace or God's undeserved and unmerited favor, it cannot be thwarted or frustrated or stop by any being in bringing about redemption or salvation, whichever way you choose to call it, in the lives of those God chose before he created the universe to be saved. Irresistible grace is a grace that cannot fail. It cannot be thwarted. It cannot be overturned. It is impossible that it does not bring about God's purposes. Or to make it personal, if you are saved, or if you have placed faith in Christ under salvation, you know, you are one of those that, you know, God chose before the foundation of the world. And he exhibited his grace to you, and it didn't fail in bringing you to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Because God called out your name to be saved before he made anything. Nothing could stop his grace or unmerited favor from moving or stirring up your heart and therefore you willingly came to Christ through faith under the salvation of your soul. It is because of God's effectual, effective special grace that every one of his chosen people will certainly be saved, redeemed, and spend eternity in the presence of God as opposed to spending eternity in the place Jesus called a place of everlasting torment, also known as hell. And I say this because God's grace is never in vain or ineffective, but it always accomplishes his purpose. Martin Luther, he states it like this in the bondage, of, of, of the will. God's grace is immutable. You cannot frustrate the grace of God. God's grace always brings about what it, it is purpose to do. And so irresistible or effective or special grace can be and it is resisted by sinners. It can be resisted as evidenced by the fact that those of us who are saved resisted the call of God in our lives 
unto salvation at some point. It can be resisted, but it cannot be thwarted. That's the point. It cannot be overturned. Because God's effective or effectual grace, it overcame our sin. It overcame our unbelief and rebellion against God. And it accomplished God's purpose in our lives by turning us towards Christ in faith unto salvation. So let me say that again. God's grace can be resisted, but it can't be thwarted. It can't be stopped. It cannot be rendered ineffective. And we can clearly see this effective, effectual, special grace in Paul's testimony of his conversion from a thug persecutor of the church to an apostle of Jesus Christ in the text I read to you from 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. Notice, Paul says, I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. In these verses, Paul states the fact that he was an apostle. An apostle of Christ in the New Testament sense, not in today's sense, because I personally think apostles in today's sense often means a shyster or religious huckster. But an apostle of Christ in the New Testament sense or during the first century A.D. church, it describes a special category of men who no longer exist, for there were only 13 of them in the history of the church. I know there is an in-house debate among equally dedicated brothers in Christ as to whether Matthias was truly numbered among the original disciples or whether the 12th apostle was Paul. But for the sake of this lecture, Matthias was chosen to replace Judas as one of the apostles. Um, and also, there's no doubt the Bible says Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Be that as it may, all of these apostles ministered in the first four decades of the first century church A.D. with the exception of John the Beloved. Who ministered well? Who ministered into uh, the late first century into the early second century A.D. And so these apostles were the original disciples of the Lord, including Peter, his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, his brother John. There was Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew. There was James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and and Simon, excuse me, the zealot. Um, and there was one chosen after Jesus ascended back to heaven to replace Judas who hung himself. And he was chosen by the drawing of lots by the remaining disciples. His name was Matthias. And then lastly, there was Paul whose apostolic office was unique and special because he was not part of the original disciples for during Jesus' earthly ministry and the beginning of the early church, he was an enemy of the cross of Christ. And so the qualification for the office of apostle included being a personal eyewitness to Christ's bodily resurrection from the dead. In other words, one had to have actually seen Jesus in his glorified resurrected body to qualify as an apostle. And we read that in Acts 1, 21 through 22. But this was not the only uh, qualification. They also had to work certain signs of a true apostle. And we read about that in 2 Corinthians 12 and 12. When these specific men function in their apostolic office, they function with the full authority of Jesus Christ as his voice to the church through the infallible and inerrant leading 
of the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus sent to them to lead them and to guide them into all truth, just as we read in John chapter 16. Therefore, the oral teaching of these apostles, it bore the full authority of God himself, or Christ himself, and their New Testament letters to the churches and specific individuals are the word of God and all that they teach. In other words, they bear the same weight as the Old Testament scriptures, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the historical book of Acts. And so Paul considered himself one of these apostles but he really didn't think he was fit to be included in this group. Because after Christ ascended back to heaven to the right hand of the Father, he was one who severely persecuted and ravaged the church in his ecclesiastical position in the religion of Judaism in one of the strictest of the Pharisee, or the Pharisee sects. Yet he became an apostle of Jesus Christ with the same apostolic authority as the original disciples, those such as Peter. And he became an apostle, he says, by or through the grace of God. He says it in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace was not in vain towards me. When Paul says God's grace was not in vain towards him, what Paul is saying is God's grace was effective in bringing about God's purpose, Paul's conversion, and putting him in his apostolic office. It was it was it was not an ineffective grace that may or may not have brought about God's purposes in Paul, as many believe, because many believe you can thwart the grace of God. Think about that. A sinner who doesn't understand God, doesn't seek God, who God says is useless, you know, not one righteous, no, not one. Where do you think you get the power to frustrate the grace of God? You know, you are under, uh, you know, when you're not saved, you are under the control of Satan, the God of this world. You think Satan has more power than God to thwart the grace of God? So this grace that God exhibited towards Paul, it was not an ineffective grace that may or may not bring about God's purposes. But it was effective. It was an effectual grace which accomplished God's purpose in Paul, a man who was formerly an evil and wicked man, a conspirator in the murder of one of the first deacons in the church named Stephen, and he was responsible for the deaths and mayhem perpetrated upon many believers in the infant of the early church of Jesus Christ. In addition, beloved, on the day Paul was converted, he was not seeking Christ as his Savior. He was not on some search for the truth. He wasn't seeking the Lord. He had not been under some long-term conviction by the Holy Spirit because of the guilt of this sin and his need for the atonement that was in Christ Jesus. Nobody had handed him a Romans road gospel tract because the book of Romans hadn't even been written at this time. As far as we know, no Christian had knocked on Paul's door and witnessed to him. For all the evidence we have in Acts chapter 9 reveals every Christian was scared stiff by even the mention of the name of Saul of Tarsus, later to become Paul, because he was a notorious persecutor of the early church. On the very day that Paul was converted by Christ himself, 
he was in the process of ravaging the church. And it reads like this in Acts 9 verse 1. Now Saul, later become Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So it was at this time when Paul was traveling and approaching Damascus, a light from heaven flashed around him, and Paul fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he, Saul, let it become Paul, said, Who are you, Lord? And he stated, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul had been in a state of resistance, resistance against the Lord. But Jesus is clear in this verse that he was persecuting him. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This is resistance. Therefore, we see God's grace can be resisted, but we shall see next that God's grace cannot be thwarted or negated by neither man nor angel. For at, the very, at this very moment, what happened? Paul willingly became one who trusted in Christ as his Messiah and Savior. And the proof of this is in Acts 9.5 when he called him Lord. Paul attributes this conversion experience to the grace of God. A grace that he said had not been given in vain towards him. In other words, God's grace in bringing about Paul's conversion, it was effectual. It was effective. And it could not be thwarted or stopped by anyone. For it brought about that which God had ordained for Paul before he was born. And I say this because... Paul is clear. In his letters, he was chosen by God unto his apostleship before he was even born. I quote Galatians 1, 13 through 15. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace. God's grace overcame Paul's sin, his evil, and his hatred of Christ's church, and it overcame Paul's obvious resistance to the Lord. And this moved Paul to willingly place faith in Christ as his Messiah and Savior. To the extent Paul can make a statement like this in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As you read about Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, you see nothing there that even hints that the Lord Jesus Christ forced Paul to receive him as Savior and Lord. But we do see Paul saying yes to the Lord willingly. What brought all of this about? Well, it was the effective, effectual, special, irresistible grace of God that always accomplishes God's purposes. The same effectual, effective grace of God was granted to everyone who is a believer in Christ unto salvation. That is this, before all of us were saved, 
we were in a state of rebellion, sin, wickedness, and unbelief. And Jesus said, the Son of God, truly God, truly sinless man, Lord, Master, and Ruler of the universe. We may not have been as wicked as Paul by persecuting the church, but we were just as bad off as Paul because the same sin nature which led Paul to persecute the church beyond measure, we possess the same sin nature. It is because of this sin nature all of us were separated from God. We wanted no part of Christ. Maybe even thought all Christians were weird and crazy. And we certainly didn't want anybody telling us anything about Jesus. However, while we were in this state of sin, while we were in this state of sin, we didn't know it. But God had chose us to be saved before he even made the world. It is because of this, um, nothing could thwart or stop the grace of God in bringing about our conversion when we willingly turn to Christ as Savior through faith. The grace of God cannot be thwarted. It cannot be frustrated by man. If God called out your name in eternity past to be saved, And he exhibited his grace towards you. It could not be thwarted. It cannot be failed. There is no power in heaven and earth that can thwart the grace of God. Why? It is effectual. It is effective. And from this standpoint, it is the irresistible grace of God. No one could be saved apart from this special, effective grace of God. If God had not exhibited his grace towards you, you would never give your life to Jesus. Because that would have been contrary to your nature. In which you were an enemy of God. And a friend of the devil. Although all of our conversions and circumstances were different as to the point in time we came to Christ under salvation, God's irresistible, effective, effectual grace brought about God's eternal plan and purpose in bringing about our salvation through a person-to-person -person relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, through faith in the gospel. If you are like me, many of us, resisted the grace of God. I sit up in church, and I don't want to hear none of that. Quite honestly, I didn't even want to be there. You know, I played drums in the church, but I didn't want to be there. I'd rather be doing something else. And so I sat through many on the call. So at first we resisted the grace of God, but God's grace overcame our resistance, it overcame our sin, it overcame our wickedness, it overcame our unbelief and rebellion, and it turned us towards the Lord, and what happened? We willingly, apart from any force by the hand of God, we had a change of mind about our sin. A change of mind about the person of Christ. And we trusted in him as our Savior according to his death on the cross for our sins, his burial, and his bodily resurrection from the dead. When I said yes to the Lord, it was willingly. I was ready. There was no force about it. Why? The grace of God overcame me, my sin, my rebellion, my wickedness. And it brought about in me what God chose concerning me before he even made the worlds. 
And so I was not forced to be saved. God didn't force anything on me. I was ready. And on the night I came to know Christ as my Redeemer and Savior, 15th February, 1978, I was not kicking and I was not screaming. I willingly said yes to this God-man, this Savior named Jesus. I was not kicking and screaming, telling the Lord, I don't really want to be saved, but I guess I will anyways. The Lord didn't threaten to barbecue me unless I acknowledge him as my redeemer in true faith. I came to the Lord because his grace towards me was not in vain. Just as Paul said, the grace of God was not in vain towards him. But it was effective, effectual, special, and it was irresistible in bringing about my conversion and my redemption. All of us have a different story. But the grace of God that was abundant towards all of us was not in vain. But it was effectual and effective. It overcame all of our sin, turned us to God's Son, Jesus Christ. And as a result, we willingly received Christ as our Savior and our Lord. This is the irresistible, effective Effectual grace of God, which always accomplishes God's purposes. And so there you have it. And so once again, as I've said in the past, I have no idea who God has chosen to be saved. It's not my business. But I do know those who have come to know the Lord, you were chosen before the foundation of the world. And God's call to me and every other Christian is to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in order that men and women can believe on and in this gospel and be saved from sin and all of its consequences. The greatest consequence is being separated from God. In that place, Jesus warned men about constantly saying you don't want to go there. It is a place of weeping, wailing, and the gnashing of teeth. And I kind of suspect that's why man is innately afraid of death. He is afraid of what is to come after this life because he knows he's not prepared for the next life. And so we, we fear it. And, um, and you need to be afraid of it. You know, if we take Jesus' warnings about it seriously, you know, it's, it's, it, it should be a concern of yours. You know, um, The older you get, it should be a greater concern. You know, some of my classmates out there from high school and college and junior high, you know, you know, you may stumble across this. You know, I am 63 years old, be 64 next month. You know, we need to face the fact that we don't have another 63 years. Some of us may get 10 if blessed, another 20, make it to our 80s. But, you know, we're, we're at the tail end, beloved. Are you ready to step out into eternity? The only way you can be ready is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. All I can tell you, beloved, is Jesus' body was stretched out on a cruel, rugged cross. And the reason why it was there to take your place, your sinful self. And on the cross, he took the punishment you deserve in hell. He suffered the penalty for your sins on the cross. He suffered on the cross and died on the cross in your behalf. Jesus was sinless, never did anything wrong and thought word or deed. He was crucified 
as a payment to the Father for your sins. And God accepted what Jesus did on the cross as a full payment to wipe your sin debt clean, to wipe the slate clean. He was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day. And there is salvation in nobody else but Jesus Christ. Turn to him. Come to him. Have a change of mind about your sin and a change of mind about Jesus Christ. And come to him in faith. He is the only solution for your messed up life. Everything that's wrong in your life is a result of your sin and your choices. Period. And then there are other things we just suffer in this world because it's, it's, it's just part of living in this fallen world. But m m m most of the mess and turmoil in our lives is because of sinful choices we have made. And so that's your issue. And not only will it mess up your life right now, it'll lead you straight to hell. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Republicans can't save your soul from sin. Democrats can't save your soul from sin. Your mother can't. Your father can't. Your good works can't because you don't have any. You know, Martin Luther said man, man has no merit. He doesn't have anything. You are spiritually bankrupt in the eyes of God. You have nothing to offer up to God. In spite of that, he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. Turn to him in genuine, true faith. Believe he died for your sins. He was buried, but God raised him from the dead. If you can grasp that in true faith, the Bible says you shall be saved. Shall is a modal verb, meaning you can't help but to be saved. And so we trust the word of God. Please, beloved, turn to Christ before it's too late. Turn to him. And then, as the old folks say, you can know that you 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 are one of those God chose to be saved before the foundation of the world. And because of that, his grace towards you was not in vain, but it accomplished exactly what God wanted it to accomplish in your life to the saving of your soul from sin. All right, my beloved, uh, that's all I have to talk about uh, for today. And I'll probably the next time I'll, I'll, I'll be before you and I'll talk the perseverance of the saints. And that will end this lecture series on the doctrines of grace. I think then I'm going to go ahead and talk about the five solas. And then uh, we're going to move on wherever the Lord leads us and guides us as we continue to travel through this good word of God. All right, my beloved, God bless you. God bless you. Let us pray for one another. Uh, a lot of turmoil in the country. We need to pray. Um, turmoil all over the world. We need to pray. Remember, Christians, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The world can only be as good as we are being good as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So let your light shine, beloved. Live for the Lord as a testimony that you truly have been redeemed from your sins. All right, my beloved, till the next time, God bless you. Good day, good night, good evening, my beloved.